Welcome to the Nobody Listens podcast. I'm Maddie. And I'm Ruven. Today we will go on discussing The Never Ending Story by Michael Ende. Today we will be looking at the second half of the story, which begins when Bastion has entered Fantastica. And unlike the first half, which goes back and forth between the two worlds as detailed with the red and green text, this part is pretty much set in one world until the very end. And doesn't it feel weird when you see the red text again? When you just haven't seen that for quite a while? It kind of sucks you are. I mean, I've got... I've got a different edition in which it's um, normal text and italics as opposed to red and green. Italics for Fantastico or italics for the real world? It, italics for um, the real world. Ah, really? Yeah. By the way, do you think that an audiobook of this would benefit from two different readers? As in? As in uh, one narrator for Bastion's World and one narrator for Fantastica. Maybe. Because it would be even more of, oh, I've heard this with a different voice than, oh, I've read this with a different font or color. That would be, that would be a little um, creepy and trippy, but it would be really effective. It would. Or maybe, I mean, I mean how else can you, an audiobook is just the easiest... Um, way to adapt something. I mean, it would be also fun to have a movie where only Bastion's parts are actual movie stuff and yeah. the, um, the... As you said... And though, everything um, else is an animated, you know? The first half, which we discussed last week, doesn't doesn't really translate into a movie, particularly with the nothing. Yeah, it doesn't. So it's weird that they... Unless you... Turn that half I into a movie. I suppose you could... You could just show it as um, bits of places and people and all that kind of fading away or being eaten up by some invisible thing, as was detailed with the, um, what were they called again? The bark trolls. The bark trolls, yeah. Which are basically ants. Down what to I their just, backs and everything. What I just thought about uh, with what I said, just film best Jim's parts and have everything else be animated, there is actually a movie like that. It's called uh, Page Master. Which is a movie which I think is based on like a picture book, but the problem is the movie also kind of sucks, but that idea could be stolen. That's a it good could. idea, the movie just isn't particularly good. But this half, I don't think it could be adapted easily either, because a very great point in this, a very but great thing. deal of time time in this book is spent on Bastion losing his memories and kind of losing himself and that can be only shown in a book like this I think I think um, the second half more than more so than the first half could make for a really good CGI fest but wouldn't do justice to the story yeah like there is a lot in this that would look good in a movie but you kind of would lose the story yeah in the beginning of the first half, it's basically just him yelling, Moon child, moon child, into the darkness. Well, that doesn't go on for, for a long time, does it? I'm sure that cracked you up when you first read it. It kind of didn't because I saw the movie before I read the book and it's less silly in the book than it is in the how movie. Did, how did no one found, find him in the school, though? That's a good question. Someone must have heard that. I mean, I don't think he's really shouting it. I think he's in... I mean, even if he was shouting that when he oh, was... the question is... I just thought of something. Yeah. When he is yelling that, where is he? Yeah, that is the second part. There is no one in the school anyway, and also he could be somewhere in between or in the newly created Fantastica. Because, yeah, he creates this world anew. It's kind of... And then throughout, there's this theme of him having just created everything, but it having always existed. And it's kind of this whole idea of time not existing. That, that's like such a stone of thought. It's one of you, the first you know times I mean. I've experienced this, this, as you said, um, thought that fucks you up. When I read about this creating something and then it having existed for thousands, thousands of years already. Because those are good point made later. 
when he's in the desert about what was it again about the, it wasn't the desert it was later about the past kind of only exists in stories yeah so it could it always continues to exist but it's also the past like it kind of really makes you question the concept of time by the way bringing up concepts and making you think about them do you think that there was actually a point to bring on this lion grauber man in the beginning other than playing around with these concepts of duality and i him. was just i was just about to bring that up that you know how in the first half we see with fantastica there's not much of this judgment not many opposites good and evil light and dark duality stuff like that but the first thing he brings with his mind which is raised in the human world the yeah. first thing he brings into fantastica is polarity and duality and all of that i mean there is actually talk about duality and all this all over this book i mean it's about two different worlds and the thing it symbolizes the orin is an ouroboros with added duality it's yes. not one snake biting it's seven the tail it's thing is, two I don't I don't necessarily believe that duality is as much of some kind of universal spiritual truth as a lot of people make it out to be but I will say that duality is probably like the first concept that's conditioned into human beings yeah I don't think it's a truth any any further than social conditioning goes but it's like the first thing we learn I mean because there are a few important things which actually work on duality they kind of mm. want to shove everything into the system for example you know that night and day at is a clear duality right and so people want to shove um, summer and winter into the same duality even though it's a bit more fluid than night and day is and then they want to take whatever's the most ingrained concept of duality in maybe the social sphere such as gender or something and put a pink and blue tag on everything by the way did i ever mention and that just starts to spiral out of control did i ever mention how pink became to be the girl's color you did should i should i just tell that to the audience sure all right so pre world war 2 It used to be that pink was a boy's color and light blue was a girl's color, but that then changed because the Nazis used the color pink to identify gay men. And even though that thankfully ended and now even most people are on board with homosexuality as acceptable, we still don't make little boys wear pink because that is how the Nazis branded gay people. So I don't have a point to make. I just it has some to... pretty homophobic origins. Yeah, it, and it's still you can't make a boy wear that that's girly and also that's gay. But it's kind of like with those with those concept because gender is pretty much ingrained in a very binary and dualistic way. Everything, everything existing in the universe, someone somewhere out there has coded as quote unquote masculine or feminine. Yeah. Anything you can fucking think of, even outside of everyday human life, just just anything you can think of. By the way, isn't it weird? That's what pisses me off. Yeah. Isn't it weird that this book brings up a lot of dualities existing in some points and then other things being more of a unity, but actually has no creatures which have explicitly other sexes, not other genders, but other sexes than humans do. Every species is yeah. either male and female or it's not brought up. Yeah, there's not that's not necessarily brought up so much. So I wouldn't say the concept of duality whether relevant or not is challenged, but I would say thankfully the writer doesn't force it onto everyone and everything. No, but it's brought up a lot. I think in this the way I look at it in this context The first thing he brings into Fantastica is duality because that's just that's just the way humans are conditioned into thinking. That's just the thing that's ingrained straight into our brains. So that's his concept of creating a world from that. But doesn't Fantastica thrive on human thought 
and human creation. Yeah, but it's also yes. everything is. I don't know if you have that saying in England or in the English speaking world as well, but it's kind of a sword with two blades, as in you can't grab it. Even if you want to hurt someone, you're gonna hurt yourself. A double edged sword, you call it. Sorry. Yeah. Um, it's a bit of a double edged sword with the world being created anew from our world, but that also means that some things, some of our ideas, which are necessarily good, come over to that world. And a lot of this book seems to be about such compromises. And it brings a lot of ideas up without really challenging them, just exploring them, I guess. Yeah, so just the idea of duality is not necessarily always a good thing. I mean, it's not... If we're always stuck in dualities and black and white thinking, it's not progressive. It just It's not even regressive. It's just... It just gets you nowhere. It just keeps things stuck exactly where they are. By the way, what do you think about a Falcor and a Treyu showing back up? By the way, Falcor and a Treyu is are my the favorite character. Only characters who are in both halves of the book. Why is Bastion so mean to Falcor? I don't know. It's really uncalled for. It is. But I think it's kind of weird that they show up again. Because it's not very clear whether this is a continuation of the old Fantastica or whether this is a completely new thing and it kind of takes away from the mystery maybe which one it is both. because maybe it's a bit of both but wouldn't that's it... like the whole theme throughout is this newly created is it carrying on is this in his imagination has he actually stepped into another world what's happening i mean something magical it's both something magical is happening is happening the yeah. book is gone at the end i completely forgot about this that the book is not there anymore when he comes back into the real world at the end. It just disappears. Yeah. Is anyone going to mention how that's a, sto that's a story for an and will be told another time? In which context? That's another story that will be told another time. You mean the final one? Every At every single point where the author can't be bothered to carry on with a storyline. Yeah, it's a bit of a sequel hook, I like. I do, but where's the sequel? There are actually a few sequels to this. Some people wrote them. But they are only available in German and I don't know whether they are good or not. Are they official sequels or fan fiction? They are officially published by ah. the same publishing house, but I'm not sure. There's probably a lot of... This is this is ripe for fanfics, though. Yeah, but as I said, you can't Plead really once. find much discussion about this book online. Is it quite obscure outside of Germany? I'm not sure. I mean, you got hold of it pretty easily. I did. And... It has a decent English translation. It has had a, a lot of decent translation into other languages. The author actually spent the last years of his life with a woman who translated it into Mandarin or Japanese. I can't remember now one of the two. It is translated into all kinds of languages, but I'm not sure why discussion oh. of this book is kind of dead online. Is anyone going to mention the... When he gets the grain of sand from Moonchild, which turns out to be a seed... Yeah. Did you notice the first thing he grows? He grows it into a poppy, yeah. With the fruits forming and exploding from the flowers. With, you know what I'm going to yeah, say about poppy. Yeah, you think this is about drugs. You, the only thing you get from that is opium, right? That is the only thing you make out of poppies, isn't it? Yeah, but there's quite, there's quite a few opioid substances out there. I thought... I'm not suggesting to do them. I thought it's mostly because that the... Kids, fire... don't do heroin. That, that is also puppy? Oh, I didn't know. I was thinking he brought it up because, you know, it's a bit of a fireworky flower. So it's a bit of a celebration. Because basically how a puppy recreates is the world's slowest firework without fire. That's such an innocent thought process. That's adorable. I first read this when I was about seven or eight. It's still adorable. And I actually thought that um, the recreation process of poppies was fascinating as fuck. It kind of is. Yeah. Also, the second thing he changes after creating the forest is... Well, he he notices, he, does, he doesn't even know this has changed, is his appearance. Yes, into someone who is 
physically a lot more fit and wears oriental clothes. Being described as a looking like a prince from the Orient. Yep. Isn't his middle name one of the three wise men? It is. I see what he did there. And his... F- one thing I did notice, I don't know whether this is the same in the German translation, but his face and his appearance is being described as manly. Yeah, I noticed that too. And later throughout he's... And you just said the German always... translation is a book originally written in German. Whatever, bitch. Throughout the book, it's always talking about how he wants to do things that are considered brave and strong and basically socially coded male. Yeah. Do you think part of some of the things he wishes in this part of the story are kind of to do with a crisis about fitting in with society's quote-unquote masculinity? What I was thinking is something closely related to that but i didn't actually think about fitting in i thought this story is kind of has a few points about what would happen if you threw the biggest powers ever on a typical white nerd because i mentioned he is <laughs> an outcast in every way you can be without actually being part of any minority nor female that's true and I, it's not that how, how your stereotypical white nerd actually chooses to be a non-white person. Yeah, that is kind of the first thing he does without even thinking about it. He's wearing those oriental yeah, that was which I actually didn't consider a race point before this time because, you know, I kind of just thought that is because of his nerdiness and obsession with different books and stories. And I never noticed... When I last read this, that you know, that it was the people in those stories point. aren't white, because I mostly knew those stories because of German tellings mm. of them and German illustrations of them and the Disney version of them, which you know, whitewash a lot. And I showed you from my grandfather's uh, storybook the Oriental pictures, right? Mm-hmm. Which are basically just white men with turbans. So that was my picture of the Orient until. Yeah, until I was 12 or so. I could go on about Disney whitewashing for a long time. We, we will do another, a Disney that episode. That is another story to be told another time. And we will do at least one Disney episode soon. <laughs> at least one we will probably will do quite I had a long. huge debate about this with somebody the other day. I, I will go into this another time. You should. I will. We are doing a lot of sequel hooks. So, yeah, Bastion mostly appears in Oriental clothes for quite a stretch of this book. And also the names he gives to stuff all sound, well, foreign to a German person at least. I'm not sure if I would describe them all as Oriental. Also, shall we go straight into the damsel in distress trope that comes up? Yes, which is kind of best from the start of darkness. Yes. Very early in the book, he helps out a wannabe hero by giving him a quest. By creating... Do you want to give some? Do you want to give some background about? Um, okay, so Bastion goes through the the Temple of a Thousand Doors, isn't it? Yeah. Until he finds one door, which he opens and finds himself in a garden with this princess who is sitting there playing a musical instrument, whilst this self-proclaimed hero and his three knights are sat around. Yeah. This hero is one arrogant guy who thinks he's the strongest, toughest, bravest, whatever, he's basically, in all of Fantastica. He's basically a parody of every boring hero ever. And she's basically a parody of every every boring... Love interest what, what would be of the those characters Love ever. She's, Love she doesn't do very in much, quotes. Except She doesn't do very much, except that she demands that any man that she'll settle for must be the strongest and the toughest and whatever. So basically... The stereotype of the kind of women that sexist men accuse women of being, accuse women of being picky and all that, and wanting men to be this or that or and be tough. But you you know what I mean. I do. But just on one hand, they they complain about women being like that. On the other hand, they want women to be subservient like this all the time. But this one of the like, heroes oh, wait. can't fit into this role now that he can't be the toughest he's ba- anymore he's basi- because he has... He's basically just one minute, oh, this woman wants me to be so tough, this woman wants me to be like this or like that. The next minute, 
I need to be big and tough because I want a woman who wants me to be like that. I want a woman who wants who wants me to sweep off her feet or whatever whatever the fuck they're calling it these days. I wish people like that could make up their fucking mind. Or do they just want something to complain at women about? Bingo. Honestly, though, I really don't like her very much. I don't think you are supposed to like either of them. She's kind of just sitting there expecting him to be big and tough and all that. But he can't be the biggest and toughest now because Bastion has literal god powers basically and so to actually give him a challenge he creates a dragon to kidnap her and has him go after the dragon which is very good for the reader because we don't have to deal with them from now on but do the means justify the ends and is the weak and fickle damsel in distress trope actually challenged she doesn't become any less passive and demanding yeah He gets put in his place, but is still no less arrogant. Well, the story teases about him having some growth of characters while doing it, because apparently he, he doesn't want her anymore. Rescues her, but doesn't want her anymore. But we don't get any closure on that on how it actually ends. By the way, you get how this is a never-ending story, and has a lot of uh, unanswered questions with no endings, right? Mm-hmm. So it's not only about this thing where the story repeats over and over again, but it's also about the story going into all directions without any endings there. So the story is unending or never ending into two different directions. Yeah. Which is another Later, reality. Though, it does show Bastion wondering whether or not him creating the quest was a terrible idea. But that's not really good enough at that point. But that's the point, isn't it? That... He, he realizes later that that was a really shitty thing to do. Yeah, it's the first really shitty thing he does. I, I but think yes, the yes, reason why she's really people... annoying, but that that doesn't mean he should use her as a what, what's the word? As a what? To give to give him something to do. Bait. Use her as bait, basically. Yeah, yeah. The thing is, many people prefer the first half to the second half. Mm. I think it's a bit because. It's kind of insulting to the readership at times, but like in a insulting, not as in telling someone they suck, but in oh. in nudging someone in the right direction, because this thing basically challenges the readership a lot. Because most another, people another who read thing, this are like Bastion. Another thing about the um, stock image fairy tale quest scene: yeah. the name of the dragon. Yeah. We brought that up last it's time. It's called Smurg in this. Yeah, we, oh, yeah. we did. And and it says that there's a country called Morgul, the land of the cold fire. Yeah, that is like Minas Morgul. Yeah. And are you going to mention where the knight's uh, song comes from? You should. You're the English person around. Okay. I'll have to give a bit of backstory on that. So at the point where Bastion his mule and the three knights were off to look for the creators of the um, tower, weren't they? The the supposed u ugliest beings in all fantastic. And on the way, the three knights begin to sing a song, which had apparently been sung by a human who has visited Fantastica, whose name is basically Shakespeare spelled wrong. Spelled wrong in a different way, depending on what language you read the book in. But yeah. it's spelled phonetically. Does it... Phonetically-ish. It's spelled phonetically in the German version. I mean, do you This... do you guys even have phonetic writing? No, Because really. You know... Our version has it as S-H-E-X-P-E-R. I mean, English de de kind of defies phonetic yeah. writing because your spelling doesn't make sense. That's true. It only gives two lines of the song. Well, you can just read more of it in Shakespeare's writing because it's an actual song from some Shakespeare comedy. I don't know which one right now. Come to think of it, it is. I can't think of it right now. Because you mentioned mm. them before, these the beings who are at first very miserable because they are so ugly, who Bastion then turns into better looking creatures that are just very cocky and annoying. They are being brought yeah. up later in the story again one of the only times the character from earlier reappears is i actually i actually really liked them in the beginning but when 
when he did what appeared to be a good deed for them, how come he seemed to get rid of all of their intellect and I don't know thought process. They were just I suppose too busy be being of, happy to be thoughtful. That can kind of be looked at one. I know this is a very deep and not necessarily relevant comparison, but it's just a thought that sprung to mind whilst I was reading this. Yeah. Which is that, you know how a lot of the times when people have started off either with not a lot of money or in a certain demographic that doesn't give them any social advantages, mm -hmm. there are some, there are a few people who happen to make it from there. Yes. As soon as they make it, they'll go on about how they're self-made and suddenly just become really conservative and forget the struggle that they went through. You know what? And forget the others who are going through it. I have a... Because it's become good for them now. I have a less deep but more relevant point, which I just... Thought, you see my point yeah, though, do. right? But what I was just thinking is, aren't the Acharis and the Shlamuvs kind of a parallel to Bastion himself, who in the real world is miserable but mostly a good guy, who then, when he enters Fantastica, becomes at first happy, yeah. but is a total asshole. And so are the, Achar that's, the that's Acharis what I'm saying, but... are him outside, and the Shlamuvs are him inside. Yes, you could say that's, that's a similar concept, though. And this is why they because appear again now, in the end. Because he's, he's now escaped into a world he no longer has, say, a home life or... A physical appearance that disadvantages him and is no longer being bullied in in his everyday life he kind of forgets what he went through and forgets about those who might be going through the same he kind of forgets about everything other than this yeah. world he's creating he, he forgets it all because things are going good for him now and this is also true about those people you mentioned yep yeah. and he, the way he finds out of it is basically just remembering something very, very mundane from his home life. Because in the end, the way back to the real world or his world is remembering his father coming home from work as a dentist with a copy of someone's jaw. He's really not very nice to the animals, is he? In general, yeah. He's kind of a dick to his mule. And also a dick to Falco. He's a massive dick to Falco. Who's probably like the nicest character. I mean, he is based on luck. So yeah, obviously he is... He's a, adorable. He is. But basically every time he makes a wish, he loses a bit of his memory. And with that a bit of himself, because someone's memory and someone's self are inseparable. You know, in the in the end, when when he goes into the water and he pretty much forgets his name... And he stops being referred to as Bastion, and instead he's being referred to as the boy who has no, doesn't have a name. Yes. And there's a bit about how, in order to go back, you have to completely lose yourself. Is that some kind of ego death metaphor? It might be. What I was thinking about, I did bring this up last time, is you know how Atreyu also forgets himself at one point, but then remembers who he is, but doesn't tell Gmorg because it would save him and then Bastion forgets about himself as well but actually forgets about himself and gets out of that. You know that that's literally parallel to what's his face? The guy who got lost after the Trojan War. Yeah. Why? Odysseus or Odysseus as you guys pronounce it who pretends to be no one in order to trick the Cyclops. I didn't make the connection and, until you said it, but now yeah, I, I do see that. And you know who, who also appears as a Cyclops? Igramil the Many. Mm -hmm. So Odysseus was on Ender's mind when he wrote this. Because he brings up this being no one to escape a tricky situation twice in this book. At least twice. But there was definitely some inspiration there. Another thing that was brought up at one point is when he can't always have things he believes he wishes come true that you have to really wish something in fantastic effort to come th to come true and there's a point where it says what what are what are wishes do we even have them wouldn't that be a point about free will there is a lot of points about will and free will on the orin the words do what you will uh, do what what do what you wish do, you, do what you wish I would yeah. translate the German more as do what you want. 
is written on. It is tu was du willst. It says it says it says do what you wish on here. I think that's a shitty possibly, translation. Possibly, I don't think so because it kind of works with the idea that he's wishing things into existence. The German version has makes a difference of wishing and wanting. And what I think is because the concept of will. Yes, because yes. Treyu can't read what's written on the Orin. He doesn't follow this. He just does it without much thinking about it. And Bastian reads this and thinks, "Oh, if this tells me I can do whatever the fuck I want, I'm gonna do whatever the fuck I want. I have this authority because this was given to me." But it doesn't always come true. No. But he kind of uses it where, as. Um, this is where the point of free will comes into question. Also, do the Sassafranians creep you out? They kind of do. So they're born as old people. They age in reverse. Yeah, it's another and, of Ender's shout outs to other things. In this case, um, uh, Benjamin Button. Yeah, once they've aged into babies they die something about that really creeps me out maybe it's them starting off as okay so would the newborn old pe old looking people have the cognitive function and behavior of a baby and vice versa i mean don't or would they st would they start off fully thinking and fully articulate and then when they get really old they just start sort of giggling and crying and stuff I mean... That's creepy as hell. If also, imagine all the dead babies. Well, dead fetuses. If th maybe Would they, they be fetuses? Maybe... Would they age right to the point of being fetuses? Maybe, or even then split back into being an XL and a semen? And a semen. <laughs> One single semen. I think you mean a sperm. Yeah, thank you, a sperm. A, se <laughs> a seed. Not my first language. This is another parallel about this forgetting... Wait, it says they grow to infancy. Oh, so n dying children, not Dead dying babies. infancy. It says in the beginning, as, near the beginning as well, that they die as babies. Oh. Anyway. That's creepy as hell. It is, but it's another point about leaving this world by forgetting who you are. Because babies have no sense of self. You just did it again. Yeah, I know. This is why I don't believe you don't smoke weed. I don't need weed to open my mind. My mind is open anyway. I don't need weed to open my mind, but it's fun to smoke. There's one phrase I didn't understand. Yeah. It says, there's a man-sized rooster in jackboots, a stag with golden antlers, who walked erect and wore a Prince Albert. What's a Prince Albert in this context? Because in the UK, that's a genital piercing. I'm gonna uh, check what it says in German, which... It w doesn't help that the word erect is in the same sentence. <laughs> I'm gonna get the book, which, uh, which chapter is it in? Um, the Travelling Companions. Oh, uh, it's not a Prince Albert as in the genital piercing, it's a piece of clothing. You know, what a waiter wears. That's called a Prince Albert? Apparently. As I understand it, it's a dick piercing. Yeah, because you're a perv. But yeah, it is also the only thing I know that it's called a Prince Albert. I didn't know that the thing that a waiter wears is called that in English as well, apparently. No, I, I just know it as a piercing. I've actually seen one of those. Of course, yeah. Also, the translation. It mentions a rooster, erect, and a Prince Albert in the same sentence. <laughs> it's not the rooster that's erect and has a Prince Albert, though. And thankfully. To be fair, it's a stag, which isn't much better. True. I mean, the word stag doesn't have the same implication as it does in English, but it's still an animal which is considered very Associated with... Yeah. As I said, again, people putting pink and blue tags on everything. And I mean, a stag in a fucking suit is basically one of the manly... There's a meme, can... isn't there? Maybe, I'm not sure. But I was just thinking, those are like two symbols of masculinity in one. The most stereotypical man thing. Basically, yeah. As I said, ev every everything has a pink or blue tag on it. Nothing is sacred, not even the animals. I mean, stacks and does have more sexual dimorphism than basically any other creature on Earth. Which I is not true, that. I know, but mm, of the mammals, at least. I don't know about that or what their concepts of gender are. Well, we can't 
tell the concept of gender so we have to enforce our yeah. concept of sex. Why do we need to bother? They're not humans. Why do we need to enforce our gender roles or our sexual stereotypes onto every living being? I mean, our sexual stereotypes we enforce so we can understand how they procreate and how their mating rituals are, you know? Yeah, which are quite vastly different to human mating rituals, Thank if we can be said any. Thankfully, I don't want humans to have the same sexual ideas as some animals, honestly, or vice versa. We already have enough of those. Just look at the fucking pickup artist community. That is what I was saying. I don't think any animal group would... Yeah, guys, it doesn't work. Those, those, pe those people belong in jail. It doesn't work. And those people don't belong in jail because it doesn't work. That would just make them scam artists and they are much worse than just scam artists. Where do they belong? Where they belong in jail because they are wannabe and in some cases actual rapists. That's what I'm saying. And not because they are they scam artists. They belong in jail. Yeah. They, well, they also belong in jail for being scam artists, but that's not the worst thing they do. Even if they're not actually carrying it out for even perpetuating this kind of shit. Yeah. They need to be stopped. Want to talk about Saida? I was just going on to that. I think we should. She annoys me. She does annoy me as well. Why does she annoy you? She's just so psychophantic. She's such a suck up, honestly. I mean, that's basically her whole MO. Yeah, she's just, she's just your kind of stereotypical. You know how um, fantasy and historical drama writers and producers will always have this trope of a female character who acts very supplicating and subservient towards men, or at least one man, especially, say, in a sexual manner, and then uses that to manipulate people behind the scenes. There's always that one character. I had a Song of Ice and Fire reference, but I don't know how relevant it is. Melisandre? Maybe. I mean, she is very much this character. And once... She's basically... Once again, I think that... I mean, I know that George R. R. Martin read this book because his turtle is called Mola. But this reads to me as baby's first George R. R. Martin. This whole book. There's always that one character, and I know, I know that because of the nature of the story, he had to bring up a lot of fantasy book tropes. Like with the whole damsel and hero thing, the whole point was bringing up common fantasy tropes. It kind of annoys me that if there's ever to be, say, a female villain in this kind of setting, her power is always hidden behind submission or of a manipulative nature. Which is kind of weird because she starts out looking very powerful, you know, with her, what are basically robot warriors and her castle and that she is feared by everyone. But then she goes back into being subservient while still having power over Bastion. So basically everyone in and outside the story knows of her power, but Bastion kind of blanks on it. I just wonder why they never show that trope in a male character or why they rarely ever show a female villain having power that doesn't exist in submission. There are a lot of female villains who aren't submissive at all. Maybe, but they'll, they'll always be one of these for some reason yeah. and they'll always be female. True, but I don't think that like the opposite is true, especially if you look at mainstream comics. There are a lot of women who are just, and evil women as well, who are just openly powerful. A lot of the time, they possibly defer to a relative such as a father figure or something, or later on end up in a relationship with a male character, which works within very kind of traditional ideas of heterosexual romantic relationships. Which we will bring up later in a completely different context, but isn't it kind of weird uh, that a standard character ending, if you want to get someone out of a story, what you do is... Pair them up or kill them off. Either if And you don't want to kill them is pair them off with yeah. someone of the opposite sex and never speak of them again because now they are happily married and living a boring life growing old. Mm. See what I mean, though? That always seems to happen, that no matter how powerful said character is, whenever she's paired off with a man, and it almost always is a man, the relationship plays out in a very 1950s kind of way. 
or maybe maybe something out of a tacky romance novel. You know what I mean. I, do. I get that some people are happy with that. That's fine. Fair play to them. But why does it have to be the norm or the standard? It's the norm because if it's a standard, you kind of answered your your own question. Because fiction influences us a lot. And so what's I'm talking the standard... about outside of fiction. Yeah, outside of fiction. I mean, as what, well. uh, what's the standard in the novel will become the norm in reality because we are influenced by the standards that fiction sets. Because mm. culture this, this is why it's not that person. great that that trope has continued, has continued all the way up to now. You see what I mean? I do. Want to get back to, to Zaid or Zaida? How do, yeah. how would you actually pronounce it? I'm not sure how. I'm not actually sure how I'd pronounce it. As you mentioned, do you think do you think they named her just to have something for the letter X? I do. The third to last chapter starts she with her basi- dying. She basically makes she basically makes him get rid of the mule. Yes, she kind of pus- pushes him more into solitude. Yeah, and makes him he makes his... he makes his mule able to have kids and um sends her off to find a mate which is kind of cute but it's also what you just brought up yeah it's also that she has so much more potential she does his mule is awesome but he's, he's basically a dick to her i have a much less serious point to make about the sorceress however we want to pronounce her in an english setting which is mm-hmm. she has one green eye and one red eye, which is, you know, about the book being printed in green and red. But all I can think of is this stupid rowdy from Back to the Future, who for some reason <laughs> is wearing 3D glasses outside. Do you think that her eyes signify that she's some kind of traveler between the worlds like Gmorg was? Or I never thought about that, but possibly. And because she's a big, powerful female character, to appear in this half of the is book she? where is she where who else would it be i'm i was just saying and the childlike empress doesn't show up is she kind of there instead of the childlike empress as a darker force where the childlike empress was a neutral to good force maybe like when the neutral to good force leaves the dark one trying to take over basically yeah then so maybe she was some sort of dark aspect of her or something and why wasn't the childlike empress there by the way does a childlike empress kind of give you the creep maybe a bit yeah but i mean wouldn't there's, there's so little known about her wouldn't the is it possible yeah go what were you saying i was saying wouldn't god being in the same realm as you as in being close to someone who's actually god kind of give you the creeps because she true yeah also you know how her her way of ruling was very was very different it was very much no being was seen as good or evil on this side or on that side but when she's no longer there and bastion comes in there's actually a war yes it's kind of the, the first thing that happens when he is at the ivory tower is a war breaking out so they just had two very different ways of doing things a very human way and a very non-human way i was actually about to suggest do you think sometime sometime down the line before the timeline of the story the childlike empress could have been another human who visited in the same way and didn't want to leave i was thinking about that too but doesn't the story establish that uh, there are two things that can happen with the people there, which are basically you end up in the old emperor city because you forgot yourself, or you come back out, and that it's not human nature to be like the child, like empress. Maybe, but then the point where where he forgets his name, and I thought, oh. what if a human had come in and given him a name? Oh, f- yeah. It could, it could be the case. Yeah, it could be the case. I never considered. It could that. be the case that if, if she didn't get a name. She, even though she was in a different location, so she hadn't, she wasn't just wandering around having forgotten everything. She would have just faded away back into the human world. Fade, or ended up in the old emperor city. Yeah, and then gone back, or just stayed there. I have two points about the old emperor city. Do you remember? It's called the old emperor city. Yeah. Think about it. Because those are the people who crowned themselves emperor and 
by then lost everything. I'm not sure whether the child so like Empress. Say, I'm not sure because she's not. Why else would it be called Old Emperor City though? As I said, because all the other people trying to be emperor, but maybe she's not the child empress. She's a childlike empress. And I just realized that the, yeah, this point that, is that only point... in the translation and therefore not intended. But yeah, maybe it could be both ways. But two points I have to make about the old emperor city. You know how the monkey gives, who rules the city gives the people who forgot everything this game with the building blocks of <coughs> letters where they build bricks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know what that is? What's that, that is a child. That is this thought experiments of if you gave an infinite amount of monkeys an infinite amount of typewriters they will produce shakespeare and they are giving and people oh, are, are you talking are you talking about the bit the bit where he's he's doing the game yeah and where you're given where you're given the let all the letters yeah. and basically any story is just made up of 26 letters yes that is this infinite monkeys thing in infinite arrangements yeah. Also, did you actually and re Sebastian really doesn't like it. Did you authors don't tend to like the infinite monkey thing. Did you actually read what they wrote? I just find it. Yeah. If you didn't notice, yeah, it's very clear how he wrote that. Yeah, I'm just gonna find that. Ah I see what he did. Yeah, that's the first row of a keyboard. Twice or thrice. It's in, a diff it's in a different order for me, but I still see what he did. Yeah, because the German keyboard is slightly different to an English keyboard. True. The Z and the Y are, or the Z and the That's Y what, uh, are on different parts of the keyboard and we have the umlauts. The thing I didn't notice before this time is that the guy working in the mine rod is called your mine rod. That's why... It had been it had been brought up before in the book and nobody knew what it meant. Yeah. Because nobody that he interacted with had ever got to this part of the world. No, because if you are in this part of the world, either you have completely lost the plot, literally, or you are about to enter the other world again. So that's the only way you can meet him. So they had no way of knowing what the hell that meant. Yes. And then doesn't he, when he gets to the water, doesn't he become basically the small chubby kid again? Yes. And my question is, at this point, is he still in Fantastico or is he leaving? Kind of both, because he no longer has his gift. He has his memory, but he's not, he's not sure where he is. Like with the last time, where it was kind of blurry. In which I'm looking at it as partly inspired by classical myth and partly a kind of ego death scenario. Well... Classical myths his, and explore the same ideas. His sense, of, his sense of self just has to. He kind of just has to lose his sense of self before he can advance any further. He's he's kind of come to that point. Also, the bit with the um, plant woman. Yes, we are Lana. Is this is this kind of a bit about, like a stereotypical mother figure? Yeah. It's kind of. It's kind of a nice moment, but all the same... Yeah, I noticed that. And it kind of doesn't advance the plot. Well, it's a nice little moment, but I, I kind of see the issues in terms of promoting the whole parental roles thing. Maybe it helps him understand the situation with his father, though. In what sense? In the sense that he somehow his relationship with his father has changed when he enters the real world again and i don't know how that could have happened because this is the only part in the book where he interacts with a parental figure it is but it's strange how um it's again the whole nurturing life-giving mother stereotype she is very much a, the most stereotypical mother you could be. She's basically a mother goddess. Yes. And I really, I really don't think um, the mother goddess archetype is as empowering as a lot of people seem to believe. It's very, it's very essentialist. It's very, 
I guess, quite limiting and attributing certain traits into gender boxes again. Yes. Like, it may it may seem powerful on the surface, and I'm not I'm not saying it's not, but it's really it's really not great to associate an archetype with a gender or a biological sex. Really. I have one more point to make. You mm. know how a lot of people who look at different religions kind of find yeah. that female goddesses can be classed as mother maidens and crowns. Yeah. And in the third chapter, we have Morla, who is a crone. In the third to last chapter, we have Uyalala, who is a mother. And in the middle of the book, we have the child Wasn't like Uyalala the oracle? No, wait. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. She had a similar name. Yeah, she had a similar name and I can't pronounce it, so I just thought to say Uyalala and that's the oracle. Yeah. My bad. How to pronounce her? Aeola, wasn't it? Something along those lines. I have no idea how... That is such a mess of letters. Like, no, she's... She has a really sweet personality and all that, but... Yeah, I noticed that. Wanna end on some positive note? Sure. Shall we talk about the ending? If you have anything to say about the ending? Before we get into the ending. Yeah. This book isn't discussed nearly enough on the internet. I really want more discussion, fan art of any kind, fan, from fan films, fan games, or just pictures, comics. Do stuff with this book and discuss it. It's wonderful. It gives you a lot of food for thought. And with that, Paradoxically, we'll get into the ending of the never-ending story, where Bastion wakes up after an undisclosed amount of time. Well, he wakes up the next morning. Is it the next morning? So it was... It is the next... Well, his, his father then says, tells him how long he's been gone for. And from then on, he says, the relationship between them changes. His, his father takes a more active role in his relationship with him. Well, they both do. And then Bastion goes to return the book. The father offers to um, attend to steal to the stolen book, but Bastion, believing it's his responsibility, goes and does that. So he goes to Mr. Coriander's bookshop. It's actually mentioned, as you said before, that the book is gone at this point. But the bookseller is not surprised that the book is gone, nor does he consider it theft. And... It's, la it's later revealed that he visited Fantastica himself. Well, it's kind of obvious, isn't it? Because he was reading yeah. it at first and also because he obviously parallels Bastion because he's a bookworm with, well, the name pattern. The name as well. Yeah. Do you think everyone who visits as a kid has the name? No. Or at least as the first, as the first name they get, if that's the way things work there? Obvious, in that way. Obviously not, because Shakespeare was there. You know, there's still some debate as to who Shakespeare is. I'm gonna link you a video. I'm, go I'm, go I'm gonna have to link you a video by someone who is funny enough called Kyle Calgren. <laughs> so it's... So he could visit as well. <laughs> um, who, d talking about this stupid Roland Emmerich movie, Anonymous. Ah. Uh, yeah. And... Just to make you stop spreading this stupid, harmful theory. Which theory in particular? Well, the mostly the aristocratic theory. Which? That I can't think of his name right now. That um, Shakespeare was the Earl of whatever and didn't really exist or wasn't really a playwright. The most popular. Oh course, no, I, I I don't know much about that one. I was thinking more about the one that he started off writing the plays, but um, later it kind of became kind of like what happened with a lot of ancient philosophers. The same name was used, but the works were mostly written by the students, or in his case, his theatre company. Well, it could be that most of it. 
I wouldn't find it surprising if most of Shakespeare's work were just attributed that's quite, to that was one quite a normal member thing, though. That's of not necessarily a group. A... Like, um, like basically, he said he was a copywriter of the Kingsman. But most people who... That, that's not an unusual thing to happen in theatre companies. Yeah, so. and, but most people who say this um, have this thing about, oh, he couldn't have written that. He was just some boy from Stratford who didn't know anything. You know, if you want to write good art, you must be posh. And so, yeah. No, As I said, no, it's not that. And we went way off track, but we, we're still going to leave this in. I'm not going to cut this. But the next time, we won't talk about a book. We will talk about a movie again, which is Tim Burton's Big Fish. But I think we will talk about Shakespeare stuff sometime, because this was a lot of fun. We will. And we should really do that. We will. We will see you next week. I hope you enjoyed this episode of our podcast. See you next week.